In 10,000 years when we get there, we're just getting started. Heaven's going to be mighty good. And I hope you're there with me. hope you're there. I hope everyone comes to know the Lord and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The, the greatest gift, the gift that keeps on giving, the gift that cannot be matched, nothing like it in all the world. Um, take your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 3. We're going to be uh, in our second series on uh, the church triumphant. Last week we were in the end of chapter 2 when uh, God began to grow the church. When the word of God was preached, the spirit of God convicted, people repented. They uh, asked the Lord to do for them what only he could do. As they repented, they asked God to, told them that they believed and asked God to save them. And God saved 3,000 souls and they were baptized and they continued together. It wasn't a one-time thing. It was a continuous act. They were working together. They were walking together. They were fellowshipping together. They were eating together. Can I get an amen? amen. Right. And they, uh, they, they did life together. Now, when we get to Acts chapter 3, the, the question that happens is what's next? Because 3,000 souls get saved, and, and there they are. And I, well, what do we do now? Well, let me tell you some of the things they didn't do. Number one, they didn't try to recreate Pentecost. There are people today that are Christians today, that churches today, that think that we have to repeat the great act of yesterday. That, but I'm here to tell you, you can't ring a bell again that's already been rung before. That I, I'm grateful for that, but God has something fresh for us today. And they didn't go back and try to just repeat that or mimic that. They were looking for what God was doing. Now hear this. Now they're living a life with the Lord in their heart. They go to sleep talking to him. They wake up and the Lord is there. They look at their day and they're giving their day into the Lord. Really they're saying things like, Lord, what is it that you would have for me to do today? And this is, what, this is how the first century church lived. This is how the 21st century church should live. We should wake up every day, spend our time with him, thank him, pray, look into his word, growing that relationship with him. But then we, we've got to get up and we've got to go. God doesn't want us just to have a holy huddle. He wants it. God made us to work. God put us in this world. Though the church is called out, we still are in the world. So we, we go to work in the world. We're around people in the world and we talk with them and we grow relationships with them i am told and i believe this that the longer we're christians from the time of our conversion forward the smaller the group of lost people that we're around in other words the longer we're christians the more we have a tendency to hang out only with christians the problem is is that when jesus walked this world he would leave those settings to go find some people who hadn't heard about him yet. And we're supposed to be Christ-like. We're supposed to be not just going the easy way, but going the best way. We're supposed to be finding a group of people that don't know Christ yet that we can invest in, that we could do life with them so that they can come and come to know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So what we see in chapter 3 of the book of Acts is we see Peter and John get up, and they, it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon, so we don't know what's happened before that, but now they're saying, hey, this is a great time to pray. Let's go down to the temple because people are down there, right? If you're a fisherman, go to the lake or Bass Pro Shop. Amen. <laughs> You'll find some people that are like-minded. If, if you're a tennis player, go to the tennis courts. You'll find some like-minded people, right? If, if you're in the world, you ever heard birds of a feather flock together? Well, God's put some things into your life, some interest and some desires and, and where you work and, and whatever those are. Go to those places, but take the name of Jesus with you. Emmanuel. Face the day that God's given you, but face it differently. Face it differently because Christ 
is now in you. And God wants to use you. Listen, church, listen. God can only do through you what he first does in you. But if God has done it in you, he wants to do it through you. Not everyone can be called to vocational missions or ministry. Not everyone can be full-time on staff at the church. But everyone's called to be on mission. Every day we're called to be on mission. Every day we're supposed to go out there with Christ not necessarily knowing what's going to happen, but being expectant for God to do something. Let me just ask, do you wake up every day expecting God to do something? Do you, do you wake up every day expecting to do, for God to do a, a God job, a big job, that you're going to have to grasp by faith? Are, are, you, are you ready for that? Most of the time, we kind of tend to go to that which is easy. But yet, God has something better. Every day, we need to walk by faith. You remember the God-pleasers we studied in the spring? The only way that you can please God is by faith. Hebrews eleven six. 6. So let's wake up today and be expectant that God's going to do something and then say, we're going to join God in that, and I'm expecting God to do a great work. That is the way of God's church. If you have your Bible, Acts chapter 3, would you stand with me in honor of reading God's Word? The Bible says, And Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. That's 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And a certain lame or a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. He was begging. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, Look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. And Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood. Did y'all get that? That which he had never done before the first experience in his life he had seen others what others took for granted he did not have it was beyond his grasp it was beyond his ability but now he did what they did look in verse 8 so he leaping up stood and walked and entered the temple with them walking leaping and by the way, praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. I'm going to pray in just a second, but let me just add this point. We should have an expectation of God God has an expectation in us. Do we look for God to do a God work? And does God look at us and see within us a group of people that are open and willing for the God work? With wonder and amazement at what had happened. Is the world in wonder and amazement of the work and work of Christ in his church? Let's get back to being the church triumphant. Amen? Let's pray. Now, Lord, I pray that you would speak personally through your word. It is your word. It is powerful. Your spirit is here. It speaks. Father, whisper directly to us. Call us by name. May the message 
not only be given, but Lord, may we receive the message. May we be intent upon receiving the message. And Father, we will be amazed and wondered by you and all the things that you're going to do. Father, help us be the church triumphant once again. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. So Peter and John, they're just going and they enter the temple. And as they're going into the temple, they look and they, they see this man. Verse 2 says he's lame from his mother's womb. Can't walk. I do not know what that means. I don't know if there's a deformity. Most scholars believe that he was paralyzed. But if he's never used the muscles in his legs, they would atrophy. So if you looked at him, you would see pretty much bone with skin around it with maybe just a little bit of what should be muscle. You would probably look at him and see something that would look like our arms from his waist down. Have you ever seen someone like that? And this is a person that is absolutely dependent upon others. Can't do anything for himself. He can't work. So he is being given a life of begging. The family has probably provided for him and provided for him and provided for him. And now they're just grateful that they can take him to the temple where he can do what only he can do, beg. Now, I know I'm a man and I see a lot of men in here. How many of you would like to know that your life's work would be begging. We have pride. We have respect. And, and we want to uh, be able to be useful. We want to be a help to those that are around us, not a drain on those that are around us. God made us for work. God expects work from us. It should be our joy. Too many people complain about work. But I guarantee you, if you found yourself in the shape of this man... You would be grateful for the job that you had. You would be grateful for the check that would come. You would be grateful for the groceries that you could buy for that and that you could, you could extend to others the grace that would come from that. This man never had that privilege. I wonder how low his life was. I wonder the prayers that he prayed. I wonder if he ever thought, God's not listening. God doesn't care about me. God loves those people. Every day he was sat down just outside this magnificent building, a building that was unlike anything else. Solomon in wisdom built the building before. It was torn down by Babylon. The Herod tried his best to recreate it back. It was there in splendor and majesty, and he's at the gate that is called beautiful. And he sees people with smiles on their faces walking into this temple every day, a place of entrance where they would go to meet God. Yet he was left on the outside. They saw the splendor of his goodness. I wonder, you see, the, the gate would be going and coming. And, and the visitors that would be there that would see the temple for the first time or, or others who held it in such high regard and, and they would go in and come out with laughing and, and praising God and, and thanking him for his goodness. But yet this man probably felt, felt that's for them. Listen to me now, church. It could never be for me. The great sad thing is in the world today, and if you don't know it, your eyes have been shut. There are people out there that think that there is a God. They know that there is a God. They believe that there is a loving God. They believe that there's a God who cares. They're just not sure that he cares about them. They can look at my life and say, Brian is the most blessed person I know, and I am. God has been extremely good to me. I do have a good, good father. But here's the reality. The same God who loves me loves them. And he loves them just as much as he loves me. He died for them just as much as he died for me. 
I'm grateful that I have the parents that I had. I'm grateful that they took me to church. I'm grateful that Gail Smith preached a hard message at a revival service. And a, and a young boy sitting in the back, goofing off, heard a voice that was unique. Because it wasn't the voice of the preacher, it was the voice of God. And I began to feel differently. I began to feel a personal invitation. I began to feel a calling, a drawing, a desire, a want. I'm grateful that my God met me there. I'm grateful that he was patient, long-suffering, and kind. I'm grateful that when I said no, he didn't say, okay, that's it. It's over. You're on your own from now on. But you see, what I really did not realize, what I really did not know, is that there was a barrier in my life that I created, not God. It was my sin. That sin left what we call a sin debt that I could not pay. There was a barrier there just as what there was for this lame man on the outside of the temple. Others were going in, but he was left outside. And in his day, he sees Peter and John go by. I don't know how many people he asked that day. He probably listened, didn't see them any differently than any others. He probably did not look at them and say, hey, here's the two. These are gonna, this is going to be my, 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 my bounty today. This is, I just struck it rich in these two. Can I have some money? Money for the poor? Money for the lame? He probably saw them like he did everyone else. But you see, what the church should be as we walk our day is we should have an expectancy in our life that God is good and God is great and that God wants to use us. We should be looking for that divine encounter that God's already planned. Listen, when you were asleep, God's already prayed for. God's already mapped out for you. We just need to take advantage of it. That pauses me and makes me wonder how many times I have walked by the miracle that God wanted to do, that actually God wanted to invite me to be a part of, but I just walked right on by it, dull of hearing like I am. I know that I've done it. What about you? So Peter, I love this. He sees him. I wonder how many times he had seen Jesus do the very same thing. It was never a doubt in Peter's mind that God could heal. But as far as I know, I mean, there were times in Peter's ministry, I mean, Matthew 10, that Jesus sent them out two by two. He had actually seen God work even through him. But this is also the same guy that messed up terribly the night Jesus was crucified. But now, listen, there's something different in him. Church, are you listening? The same Holy Spirit that led Jesus is the same Holy Spirit that led Peter. That is the same Holy Spirit that God speaks through me. It's not me. It's Christ in me, the hope of glory. It's the same exact Holy Spirit, if you're a child of God, that lives in you. Pastor, you're belaboring the point. You better believe I am, because I don't think we're there yet. I think that you believe God can use me. I'm just not too sure that you think he can use you. So when Peter walked by and he heard this man, look what it says there in, in, the, in verse 4. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. He stopped. I believe he's looking. I believe he's saying in his spirit, Lord, is this the one? Lord, is, is this what you want to do? 
I think he stopped, he prayed, he listened. And when the Holy Spirit said, amen. By the way, do y'all know it when the Holy Spirit says amen? Well, let me tell you how. I don't, maybe you don't. When I'm preaching, there will be something in you that says, that's right. That's right. There used to be times when we would get together in church, and, and if the preacher said something profound, people would say, amen. And, and by the way, I, you, you don't know when those times are. If you're planning it, that's of you and not of God. But there's something that will just jump out of you. But, but, but I, I'm not a big amener, but I'm a, I'm a, that's right. I'm hearing Rick preach over there, and I'm like, that's right, preach it. Uh-huh, uh-huh, I like it, yeah. Preach on. Because the word amen means it is true, so be it. And literally what we should be doing in our day, every day, we should be constantly in prayer. We should be open to whatever it is that God's wanting to do. And we should say, Lord, is this it? And if God says amen, then you say amen. Are y'all good with that? If God says speak, then speak. Don't say, don't argue with him. You'll lose. If, he, if God says there's somebody that needs to hear the good news, then tell them the good news. So Peter says, look, look at me. Look at me. So he gave him his attention, expecting to receive something from them. And Peter said, silver and gold I do not have. But what I do have, I give you. <laughs> In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, he gives a command. Did y'all hear this? Rise up and walk. He didn't give a suggestion. He gave a command. He gave a command. Now, some of you can't say silver and gold, have I none? Some of you may need to give silver and gold. But it doesn't qualify because Peter didn't have it. If you say, I don't have all this, then I can't be used. Wrong. Use what God gave you. By the way, if you're a Christian, what did God give you first, foremost, and always? Christ in you, the hope of glory. So you might not have anything else, but can you think of anything better to give? Now, you might have to meet needs before you can build a relationship with them where they'll hear you. But if that's the case, meet needs. Do we do ministry at New Holland? Y'all shake your head like this. Are we going to do more ministry at New Holland? Does the world have needs? Does Christ want to meet those needs through us? Why? Not just so that they can have a loaf of bread, but they can have the bread of life. Right? We'll give them a cup of cold water in Jesus' name so they can know the living water. We'll clothe them. We'll do whatever it takes. We'll do ministry to get an opportunity, but not just so that they'll go to hell with good clothes on but so that we can tell them the good news and that they know that we love and that they know that he loves. He said, what I'm going to give you is the beginning of something else. Rise up and walk. Now look in verse 7. He took him by the right hand and lifted him up. Listen now. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Now, in verse 6, Peter made a declaration. Get up. In verse 7, he could have said, you're an idiot. I'm lame. I can't. Don't ask me to do that. You're embarrassing me. He could have gotten mad. He could have said, get out of here. Anybody else want to give to the point? But listen, this guy was ready to believe and receive. Be careful how you put those words in there, but they're very important. Because when Peter reached down, he reached up. Can you picture that in your mind? Picture Peter reaching down. And this man, with an expectation, reaches up. It's almost like the, the man that said, Lord, or, or the, the blind man said, uh, are you willing? Lord, I'm willing. I'm willing. 
And he meets him there. And he helps him up. Come on now. And immediately. When you take God at his word, God will meet you there. I think you, I don't know that you're hearing the message. I don't know that you're here. I think you're hearing a sermon. I don't know that you're hearing the message. If we will act upon it, God will meet us there. And the power of God is there. My life verse is Philippians 3.10. It changed my life that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering be made conformable even unto death. Y'all listen to me, church. I know that there's a Lord that can raise the dead. I know that there is a Lord that can take and open the door wide open. So let's see what happens. Immediately his feet and his ankle bones received strength. So he, did, did it say he, uh, he crawled up? I like verse 8. Y'all like verse 8? Y'all good with leaping up? I know we're Baptists. Does that embarrass you? Would you tell him to calm down? You can tell him to calm down all you want to. You aren't going to calm this man down. The first time in his life, power has changed him. And that which was an I can't became an absolutely I can. He leaps up. All right, uh, y'all got it in your mind? Them bony little legs. Bam! And everybody around him, what are they doing? Come on, you know what they're doing. <laughs> right? There's a gasp that went out of that old place. And I guarantee it drew a crowd. That guy's jumping up and down. Baptist, listen to me. He's probably dancing a little bit. Amen? <laughs> Fred Astaire had nothing on this man. Some of y'all don't know who Fred Astaire was. God help you. He stood and he walked. <laughs> Everybody's looking at what, what in the, what's the ruckus. I, I love the end of verse 8. He enters the temple with them. The one who was outside now gets to walk in. Not carried in, walk in. Very first time. I don't know how it works. Hadn't been there yet. But I'm going to breathe my last breath here and I'm going to breathe my first breath there. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. I'm going to be in his presence. And I know eventually I'm going to get to walk through this, down the streets of gold. I'm going to be able to see all those, uh, some loved ones, and I'm going to see some. Man, I get to see Abraham. I get to see Jonah and said, we got to be kin, stubborn as can be, right? And the thrill of being there, entering into the presence of the Lord. I don't think any of that is any different from the presence that this man had that day. I don't think it's any different than it was when I was a 10-year-old boy and I moved from the second pew over here and something got a hold of me and I said, I've got to do this. I must do this or I'm going to burst. And I moved from my sin to his forgiveness. I moved from no hope to receiving living hope. And God did me something in me that lasted forever in a day. My life was changed. Because of the work of Christ, it says that he walked and he leaped and he's praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to them. Everybody going crazy, verse 12. So when Peter saw it, he responded. 
Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us as through our own power or godliness we have made this man walk? He said, we didn't do it. Then he jumped, I love the preacher, man. He just jumped off into a sermon there. And look in verse 16. And his name, that is Jesus' name, through faith in his name has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him, that is through Christ, has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. So verse 19, he says, repent and be converted. Repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. That's the first century church. Not the building, not the temple, the people. Loving, caring, looking, expectant. Church, God could have done it any way that he wanted to, but he chose this way. He could have sent the angels to proclaim the message. He'd rather have two fishermen, Peter and John. He could have changed Caiaphas, the high priest, Annas. But he chose the normal people, the everyday people, the people who got up every day and went out into the world and lived Christ in their life. You want to know the resource of God in this world? Look around you. Y'all look at the person beside you and say, you're God's gold. Do what the pastor said. Look at the person beside you and say, you're God's gold. Lord, how in the world are y'all ever going to be obedient to God if you can't be obedient to something like that? <laughs> Do you believe it? You're his plan for this world. I love the, the verse in chapter 2 where it says, and God added daily. Are y'all good with, and God added daily? Well, if you expect God to add daily, then maybe God can add daily. Has God lost the power to save? No. Is the blood of Jesus still strong enough? to blot out any and every sin. Your shame and your condemnation doesn't matter. God will cleanse you. God will love you. God will put white robes of holiness over you. You are the best chance this world has. I'm going to say it again. You're the only chance this world has. They're not going to find it in government. They're not going to find it in the good graces of others. All that this world can give is what gave that man a little money every day just to meagerly get by. Wouldn't you rather have the power of God to change your life forever? So when you go to work tomorrow, when you go to the store tomorrow, when you go fishing tomorrow, go fish. When you go to the doctor's office, don't complain. Praise. When you're on the job, God's put people around you. Tell them the sweet story of Jesus. God has made this so unique and so beautiful. He's scattered us everywhere. And you're not going to find them unless you go with him. That's the power of the church. It's the power of one, but it's the power of one in you. Do you believe it? Do you accept it? Are you willing to do it? It's not just about vocational ministry. We're all on mission. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father God, this is your word, and it's your word for us. You're a saving kind of God. You're a life-changing kind of God. Lord, you want it more than we do. You know their faces. You know their heart. You know every hair on their head.
Lord, you didn't create us for hell. You did not create us for hell. People just keep choosing it. You came that we may have life and we may have it abundantly. But some only want it their way. They're not willing to surrender their way to your way. I pray, Lord, for godly repentance, a change of thought, a change of way. Holy Spirit, meet us there. Speak to us personally. Draw us. Father, may we be willing. Lord, may we be willing to give you our all so that you could give us your all. And Lord, if there's someone in this building today that does not know you as Savior and Lord, that is still walking in condemnation because they choose condemnation over you, God, let them know that they can let it go. They can come and receive the white robes of glory. Father, nothing can compete with you. Lord, give us grace, mercy, and boldness to do what we must do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.